everyone. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another class with the Miami Torah Center. And just before we start, I would like to remind everyone that our High Holidays uh, program is booking very, very quickly. Thank God we are doing it at the Costa Hollywood Beach Resort. Uh, we have Rosh Hashanah. We have Yom Kippur. You could come for both. You could come for one. If you'll be in the area and you want to just come for services, we have that option as well. So get in touch with us, call our office, reach out to me, and we'll be able to help you with that. Bizrat Hashem, we are going to make sure we have enough place for everybody. Bizrat Hashem. Um, this week we are learning a very, very interesting Torah portion. I personally have um, friends, students of mine who are lawyers, and this happens to be their favorite um, parasha, Torah portion. I even have a good friend of mine who is a judge here in the state of Florida, and this is also one of his favorite Torah portions, understandably so, being that this is a Torah portion called Shofetim. Shofetim means a judge. As the Torah in the beginning of this week's Torah portion tells us, that the Jewish people should set up for themselves in every single city that they have, shofetim and shoterim. A shofet, the judge, he's the one who makes the law. He's obviously not making it. He's just uh, following and carrying out the, the law based, as it says in the Torah, and our oral law as well. And then there's the shoter. The shoter is the one who enforces the law. It's not your typical type of policeman, although the, the word in Hebrew, shoter means a policeman, but that's kind of the way. There's, there's, the, there's the, I don't know, you'd call it the lawmakers and then the code enforcers. Let's put, it, let's put it that way. And this maintains a healthy and moral and ethical atmosphere in the city, in the country that each of us live in. And this, this obligation was for the land of Israel. Having said that, one of the most obvious, and we'll discuss this, commandments or prohibitions that we have in our Torah is the commandment, the prohibition against bribery. Now, right now, all of us were shaking our heads, yes, we know bribery is wrong, but we're going to delve into the depths of bribery, and we're going to soon see that there are certain situations which may not be classified as bribery, yet they really are or aren't, and why and what the mechanism of bribery actually causes to the case that is being dealt with at hand at that moment. So this is the first part of the Zer Shimshon we're going to learn. Before we continue, I just want to remind everybody that this week, very, very important, mark it down, this week, Friday night, and all day Saturday, I mean this week Shabbat, is the Zera Shimshon's Hazkara, his yard site. So it is a very, very special time, and it's an easy time. All of the women who will be lighting Shabbat candles this week, add an extra one. We don't make an extra blessing, right? But add an extra one, and light one in the memory and in the merit of the Zera Shimshon. Remember, the Zera Shimshon passed away in 1779. That is a long time ago. <laughs> However, like we know his promises, his promises is those who learn his Torah, he adopts them as his very own children. We all hear, and it's been now for some of us years, for some of us only months or weeks, are considered to be children, sons and daughters of the Zer Shimshon, since we commit ourselves to learning his, his beautiful Torah. So it would be a very nice thing to, again, in his merit, light a candle, make a prayer, make sure to do that before you light the Shabbat candle. So first light the candle of, of the, the Rabbi in Merit, and then not right next to it, like a little to the side, then light the, light the Shabbat candles. That would be the, the proper way uh, to do it, Bezrat Hashem. Again, the Rabbi's name was Rabbi Shimshon Chaim Nachmani, if you could remember. If not, just in the Merit of the Zer Shimshon, and uh, Hashem knows who, knows who you're talking about. He's a famous <laughs> Rabbi. He, he definitely knows. Okay? <clears throat> That's this Friday night, all day Shabbat. Okay. The Torah this week says in chapter 16, verse 19, this is the famous verse that we have in this week's Torah portion for the prohibition of bribery. It says, Lo mishpat, lo takir panim. Now, that means one should not pervert the judgment, neither shall they respect someone's presence. That's lotakir panim, okay? 
don't show any favor. And then the famous words, Veloti kach shochad, and do not accept any bribery, ki ha shochad ye'aver enei chachamim, shochat, um, bribery, unfortunately blinds the eyes of the wise, and visalefti vrei tzadikim, and it makes, and it makes just words crooked. Cro- words that are normally very just and straight and honest, it visalef, it makes them, unfortunately, very crooked. Before we delve into the Zer Shimshon, the Me'am Loez has a very nice uh, interpretation to this concept of Shochad. He quotes a verse in Mishle written none other than by Shlomo HaMelech. King Solomon writes in Mishle, this is in chapter 17, verse 8, and I quote, Evin chen ha a bribe is a precious stone, Evin chen. Okay, a bribe is a precious stone, we're going to explain this. Be'ene ba'alav, in the eyes of the one who has it. El kol asher yifne yaskil, whoever, whoever he turns, wherever he turns, he prospers. And the Ma'am Loez explains that to mean that, of course, if anyone would bring you a nice stone, a precious stone, you would be very, very happy with it, right? Yes. However, the problem with this is that you're not able to look or treat that person the same way ever again. It's for the good, right? If you compare a, a husband and a wife or a fiancé comes to, well, the groom before, right, when they're about to get engaged, comes to his fiancé and he gives her a ring, but there's a precious stone on there. Can he, can, sorry, can she now ever treat him the same way as before? Well, some say better, some say worse. It's definitely different, okay? So it might not be the opportune, it might not be the opportune example, but however, a gift. If someone comes and they present you a gift, especially a precious stone, you now treat them and you act towards them in a, in a different way, okay? In, 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 our, in, our, in our context, you treat them in a nicer way. You, you are acting in a, in a superior way towards them. And now the problem with this is that the judge, in any way he's going to try to convict this individual, the back of his head subconsciously, he just can't because this is the person who gave me the precious stone. And this is what King Solomon meant by his, his verse of Evan Chen Hashochad, that a precious stone, really bribery, is a precious stone. He brings the story of a individual who was traveling and he find himself in a certain town and he got into an altercation with a wealthy individual from the town. The two of them end up in court and the Dayan, the judge, is about to convict the wealthy man because it seems like the wealthy man was taken advantage of this passerby. And then all of a sudden, I want to remember what he says over here. Yeah, he, the wealthy man saw it was going downhill for him, so he gave a little wink to the judge. <laughs> and that wink could mean many things. And the judge right away figured out a way to convict the poor regular guy and instead of this wealthy guy. And the man was really bothered. He knew that he was right and that there was some, whether it's bribery or a power or something going on over here. And when he got to the synagogue in the weekend, he started screaming out, injustice, injustice. And the people came to him and he told them the story. To make a long story short, he had this case brought right back into court and they retried it and they convicted the wealthy man. So this is something which even the most righteous and the most noble and the wisest of people, as soon as they are in the hot seat, in the seat of being the judge, now everything changes. And as soon as someone acts in a different way and specifically gives something, everything now is altered, changed, and can be be very easily perverted. However, the people inside the story just don't pick up on it. And we can give many examples where we can, I can try to trick you into thinking that something was right and we will know that it wasn't because it all depends on our vantage point of whatever situation is. If I tell you a story about Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so, right away we're now very critical. 
If I say, well, would this happen to you? Or what if this happened to your child or to your grandchild? All of a sudden, we figure out a way to make everything look nice and kosher and, and, and very, very good. So this is the exact concept of bribery. It changes a person from being completely unbiased and fair to being biased, and this is what we are going to speak about in the Zer Shimshon. The Me'am Loez just finishes off before we move on, that out of all things King Solomon could have compared bribery to maybe gold, silver, uh, water, right? We know water is, is resembled to life, something special. Some, why specifically a stone? So he says, there's something unique about a stone. A stone that is held and dropped cracks and breaks. And he says that King Solomon intended that nobody can ever think that they are strong enough that when that stone, I'm not talking a little rock, right? I'm talking a stone. If, you know, cheap brick that you drop from up here doesn't break, but a, a piece of marble that you drop from, you know, shoulder, shoulder height drops and it cracks. So too, whenever someone is involved in bribery in any which way, they will crack and they will unfortunately now pervert the judgment because that's how strong bribery is. Moving on to the Zer Shimshon. The Zer Shimshon does something which many of us may have thought to do it, however we are not also fluent in our Torah to have done this. But look at this amazing correlation he does. This is not the first time, as we know, that the book of Deuteronomy is a recap, Moses' recap, of the previous four books. And this is not the first and only time that the Torah speaks about shochad, about bribery. Back in the book of Exodus, in Parashat Mishpatim, which is also a Torah portion dedicated towards law, specifically civil law. There's also a verse over there which speaks about and pronounces clearly the prohibition against bribery. So now the Zer Shimshon does something which any scholarly person, including ourselves who are here and studying and analyzing, takes the two verses and notices two primary differences between the verses and he asks why. So I'm going to read to you both verses and we'll present the Zer Shimshon's question and a fascinating practical answer that comes out of it. So our verse reads as follows. We read that first part, but the part we really need to pay attention to is Velotikach Shochad, do not take any bribery. Why? Ki shochad, because bribery blinds the eyes of the wise. Now listen to the verse in Parashat Mishpatim. It says as follows, Veshochad lotikach, okay? Bribery shall not be taken. Ki shochad yaver pikhim. It says that bribery will blind the eyes of a pikeach, okay? Not a chacham. That's one first, is first question. And a pikeach is a perceptive, a perceptive individual, a very straight, or a person who's able to see. Let's put it that way. Like the bracha that we make in the morning, pokeach ivrim, okay? Visalef divrei tzadikim, and again, same words as the end of our verse, that it, and it makes crooked the words of the righteous. So the two differences there, Shimshon points out. One of them we picked up right away, wise person versus perceptive individual, okay? Chacham versus pikeach, which is it's a, valid, it's a valid difference, okay? It's like telling you that uh, I, I drive a white car, and then you say, no, I drive an off-white car. Well, it's, it's a little different, okay? Is it a huge difference? Not. Uh, I was going to say black and white, but that's like way too different, okay? <laughs> but for example, okay, that's the first difference. He has another difference, which is a little more subtle. And anyone with the text in front of them would pick up on this. Here it says, the words as follows, And don't, tikach, take bribery. In Parashat Mishpatim it says, And bribery shall not be taken. Okay? A little bit play on the words. It's velo tikach shochad or veshochad lo tikach. So we might look at it as big deal. The Zer Shimshon says there's actually a tremendous difference between the two. So those are the two questions. The order of the prohibition as well as chacham versus pikeach. Wise person versus perceptive person. Okay, listen to the following. The Talmud in Masechet Ketubot tells us 
the prohibition, and learns from these verses, there's a clear prohibition to accept bribery. That means, obviously, if before a judgment or during a, a judgment, right, that, like that wink that we had from that story, or, you know, the person moves their hands like this, or they put their hand in their pocket, like, they do a certain gesture, or they actually, <laughs> I don't know how, how inconspicuous you can be, but you do something, or, you know, you, you slip an envelope, or whatever the case is, you make, 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 I don't know, a gesture with your mouth, whatever it is that you do, that is obviously prohibited. Okay, but there is something else the Talmud speaks about. Think about this judge for a moment. This judge could have one of two options. He could be home tending to his own business, or he could have another job. So the judge is allowed to collect what the Talmud calls schar betala, meaning work, well, sorry, money, for the fact that he is spending his time doing what he's doing now. He could be building something, teaching something, uh, selling something, he could be doing something else. So there's a basic charge for the man's time. Okay, That he's allowed to collect as a judge. So if he spent, and sometimes as we know courts can go hours upon hours, if he spent 10 hours at a nominal fee of $100, that's pretty cheap, okay? So, he is allowed to collect $1,000. Who's it collected from? Well, none, under the, none other than the two individuals that are there at court. One side, both sides, that's up to the situation to figure out how it is, okay? A judge is allowed to collect that money. However, right, because at the end, he, he could be spending his time making money elsewhere. However, the Talmud says that it is unfortunately disgusting and despicable to do so. Why? Because at the end of the day, he's still receiving money from the people. Now, it's not always $500 each. Sometimes one person pays the whole bill. Now, even though you'll say to yourself, well, does he really know? Can it make an impact? That is the power of money and the power of bribery. You might think it's not making an impact, but it still can. And therefore, since it's not outright, outright bribery, it is permitted, yet despicable. Okay? Based on this, the Zer Shimshon says, the verse in Parashat Mishpatim, that's back in Exodus, and the verse over here are talking about two different scenarios. Over here, where it says, Velo tikach shochad, you are not allowed to take bribery, that's the classic case of bribery. Bribery is not allowed to be taken at any cost. A judge shall not accept it. Why? Because even if he is so wise, the wisest possible, it will now ruin, it will taint his judgment and will not be able to give a fair judgment. That's why the terminology is that it's going to blind the eyes of a wise person. Because he could be very wise, very righteous, very knowing. However, that bribery will now mess it up. But the case, the verse in Parashat Mishpatim is different. And that's why it's not straight out prohibition, velo tikach shochad, it's rather, veshochad lo tikach. Bribery shall not be taken, opposed to do not take any bribery. Because the case over there is not a case of the judge receiving bribery, it's the case of a judge receiving payment for his time, which according to the letter of the law is allowed. However, the Talmud says that's not the right thing to do. It's a despicable thing. And therefore, you know what that's going to do? That's going to blind the eyes of a perceptive person. A person who really wants to be true. He's still wise, he still knows his thing, he still has a chance of giving a truthful judgment. However, he's no longer considered a perceptive person. His vision is no longer crystal clear. It's very different than the other case. Because bribery, no matter what changes, we all see in our lives. And this is whether it's with a judge, this is in a rabbinical court, a civil court, this is uh, with rabbis, this is with friends, this is with people behind desks, this is at people at stores. It's just the way of life. Nobody is above the concept of bribery. Now, I'm not going to come out here tonight and tell you um, different methods and tools of when bribery is permitted and it could be used to your advantage because 
There's a fine line between acting nice to somebody, expecting reciprocation, and outright bribery. For example, very often, someone is going to treat someone else nice because they want something back. <laughs> someone that you know, and maybe someone that you don't know, right? Like our dreadful moment of when we are get, about to get on the flight to Israel and we have one baggage too many and they're all overweight. So what do we do? We put on a nice smile and we say hi to whether it's the stewardess or whoever is checking us in. How's your day? Oh, such beautiful nails. Whatever the case is, like you start acting nice. Now, what is that considered? Are you allowed to do that? Are you not allowed to do that? Are you overdoing it? Well, why aren't you being as nice to the person serving that other, to the other counter? Right? Why specifically to the one to you? Okay? There is a fine line between treating someone nice because you need something from them just because they're the person behind the counter. It's like the, the behind the counter syndrome, right? Or there's flattery and maybe even bribery. So there is a fine line between the two and, and deep down in our heart of hearts we know when something is right and something's wrong. And again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't treat people nicely even when you need something from them because most of the time that's the only way to get anything done in life. And for that reason, I'm not going to give you every example because every situation, every example is different and we all need to know. On the receiving end, we can understand how hard it is to always say, tr stay true and non-bias. It depends on what type of situation we are as a business owner, as a salesman or saleswoman, as a teacher, this is very common, as a teacher to control a class. You know, sometimes there's a tendency to favor the underprivileged or the ones who, who maybe cannot pick up so quick or the goody goods, right? The teacher's pet on the other hand. So it's very important that as a teacher, as a parent, as, as a friend, to not do things which display outright favoritism bec and, and on the other hand, not to really accept certain things from certain people because then our bias and our true nature of being truthful is no longer preserved. It's very hard, but a good mechanism on trying to keep up with it is at least being aware. Even if you fall into it knowing that this is wrong, this might not be the way it should, and then that is a first step in correcting it. So it's, it's, it's a concept which is throughout the board. We, we, we know that, that cases of favoritism in our Torah were, were very, very severe. However, if we pay attention to all the cases of favoritism in our Torah, there were reasons for it. If we go back to, does anyone know? And we'll, op we'll open the floor for this. Does anyone know what the case, which, what is the first case of favoritism in our Torah? Anybody? Put your hand up. Cain and Abel. Very good. Cain and Abel is our first case of favoritism in our Torah. Answer is, it looks like favoritism, but it really wasn't. Okay, why? There was a very, very clear difference. We're not going to deal with it now. We'll deal with it, you know, maybe by Genesis time. But the Malbim, one of the great commentaries on our Torah, writes four clear, and we learn these differences from the scripture, of differences between Cain and Hevel, in their intention, in their action, in what they brought and how they brought it as a, as a, as a service and as, as a sacrifice to God. That favoritism, the concept of favoritism is promoted on based on how the person is treated. Okay? Our f subsequent cases of favoritism are specifically between our patriarchs and their children. Right? Abraham and his two children, Isaac and his two children, Jacob and his 12 sons. Their favoritism and all. But if we pay attention, and this is not validating or allowing any of this favoritism to take place, but all the favoritism that we see in our Torah had a reason for it. Not saying it was carried out and ha handled the right way. Well, obviously the case of Cain, Cain and Abel was the right way because God himself was the one who handled that. But the cases with our patriarchs, I'm not saying it was held right or wrong. We're not going to analyze that and judge that right now. However, it's important to note that any of those cases of favoritism were due to the way the other individuals involved were acting towards or set up for towards that other person. 
And it's important as a parent to know, and this is one of the greatest struggles that sometimes parents have to endure, is we have multiple children and we cannot favor one child or one grandchild over the other. I always give the example of five fingers. Imagine you have five children or five grandchildren, okay? And for no money or for no reason would you ever say, let's do away with one finger, right? No. You got a short stocky one, you got one that's good for doing almost anything, you got a big one that you use when you're angry, you have one that you could put your, 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 your ring on, right? And then you have this pinky which is good for getting into your ear when you need to. Who knows what it's for, okay? <laughs> but each of your fingers have a specific use, okay? Could you say you favor one finger over the other? God forbid. How would my hand look if I had five thumbs on it? Or five index fingers on it? Or just two of the exact same? So we need to value and appreciate each of our children, each of our students in whatever capacity that, and, and lifestyle that we are, even employees. You cannot show outright favoritism to another employee. There is the concept of motivating that employee and the rest, so you're gonna award one employee so the rest of them say, oh, so this is what happens when I do X, Y, Z, let me try to do that. There's a fine line between motivating and showing favoritism, okay? It's like if it's only the same person when the other people do that same, reach that same benchmark, you don't reward or reciprocate towards them, that's favoritism. So these are things which are all within the concept of bribery, being very careful not to administer bribery and to not accept bribery in any way at all. This is the first concept that we're learning for Zer Shimshon this week. Moving on to the second, and we have three. Okay, we're saving, in my opinion, the best for last. Okay, um, in this week, the Torah warns us against following after the ways of the Gentiles, and specifically their sorcery, and their magic, their cantations, and the things which are against, contrary to all the concepts we have learned of our connection to the Creator of the world. The whole concept of sorcery and magic, and I didn't intend on saying this, but I'll just give the concept, is making shortcuts cutting to getting something without the hard work. For example, we all know that when you go to Ikea and you buy something in this box, which is nice and small, and it turns into this big thing with thousands of bolts and pieces, okay? At the end of the day, and I'll be the first to admit, after you build something from Ikea and you got it right, I add that in, and you got it right, you feel good. Yeah. I feel good when I build something from Ikea well. Okay? Because it's a real, real task. We know that whether it's a bookshelf, a table, a chair, the, their couches are pretty easy. But whatever it is, okay? It's a project. It's a real project, and it's, it's, it becomes your masterpiece. I guess it's part of their sales tactic, because if not, like, who else would spend all day building something with a zillion bolts that's not the top quality? But anyways, okay? But you feel good. You really, really feel committed to what you did. Yeah, so there's the shortcut. You could pay another one ninety nine and have it delivered and built to your house. And that's not a dollar ninety nine, that's a hundred and ninety nine, okay? <laughs> but you don't look at that item the same way. It's like the piece of art that you painted, or better yet, you painted with your children or your grandchildren, or the art that you buy from the gallery. They both have their specific value. One of them actually has a value, and one of them's even valueless because it's so valuable, it cannot be quantified. And therefore, the concept of magic and sorcery is just cutting the corner. It's just going, and then something is created. Something good happens, but unfortunately, most of the time, something bad happens. And these are things which is contrary to what God wants from us. He wants us to have patience and growth patience and growth. As long as we're growing and as long as we're patient to getting to that goal, that's how we truly feel successful and become enriched in our success and results that we produce. This is what God wants us to stay away from. What he says over here, the Torah says over here is, Tamim tiyeh im Hashem elokecha. We are to be wholehearted. Tamim means perfect, wholehearted, 
God wants us to be wholehearted and committed to none other than Him. And to be different than because all of the nations, that you're coming and taking over in the land of Israel, you know what they do? What they do is they listen to and they follow astrologers, diviners, all these type of sorcery and the such. And God did not want this for you. Comes the Midrash. The Midrash quotes a verse in Yeshayahu, which is in the Nevi'im, in our prophets. The verse says, Ve'atem edai. God is saying, and you are my witnesses. Ne'um Hashem v'ani kel. And I will be your God. The Midrash says on this, that as long as we are the witnesses of God, and we're going to explain what that means, God will be our God. Hashem will be our God. As soon as we do not act, and we do not give and bear witness for God, then He will as if no longer be our God. So the Zesh Shimshon analyzes that, and that says that's a very, very scary and heavy concept. That means... God's existence, or better yet, because that's not really true existence, God's involvement in our lives are based on whether we are His witness or witnessing Him or not. And that's a scary concept. The problem with that is he brings a piece of the Talmud we learned a couple months ago, the Zeshim Shon quoted it as well, of two rabbis who had different opinions of how magic and sorcery really takes place in the world that we live in. The first rabbi, Rabbi Yochanan, he says that even sorcery has the power to override a decree of heaven. And we learned that from the word of how we say sorcery in Hebrew, we say keshafim. And keshafim, he uses it to say, machishin pamalya shelmala, that they are able to override the heavenly decrees. However, we have another rabbi, Rabbi Hanina. Rabbi Hanina says that nothing in this world, he says not even the bruise that a person bruises their finger with, is not decreed and ordained by God Almighty. So we have a problem. Is sorcery super involved and super powerful even above God? Or is God really the one who is in control of everything? So the answer is, as the Zer Shimshon, I think, told us once, and he reiterates it this time, is that Rabbi Hanina was different. He was a person who had a lot of merit. He was a very, very righteous individual. And because of this, there was no magic or sorcery or witchcraft which was able to affect him in any way. However, for regular people who unfortunately have sin and maybe don't make always the right decisions, the witchcraft and the sorcery can take effect on that person, which is a very scary thing. So now the Zer Shimshon now ties it into what we were talking about. He says, based to understand this Midrash, that when a person is a witness of God, you know what that means? When a person is committed to Hashem, he believes in Hashem and only Hashem. And he puts his trust only in God. That's when Hashem will be a God for you. But when a person bears witness to other gods, other religions, other powers, and in the life we live in, to addictions, to shortcuts, right? What's one of the quickest shortcuts to rid oneself of pain? To take drugs, right? No, that could be over-the-counter drugs, that could be black market drugs, that could be, you know, drugs in the form of, of vegetation, and, you know, others are minerals already, or however you look at it. But all of that are all shortcuts to happiness. And we all know that th- those shortcuts of happiness do get you there very quickly, but sooner than later, quicker than you've got there, you find yourself even further away than when you started. And this is the problem. And and, and these are are 
pains, this is not only physical pains because we all know of people who've used these type of things, CBD oil and the such, oh, it's not, it's not addicting, who knows, okay? Anything that works too quickly, anything that looks too good is not true. We all know that. And therefore, all these types of shortcuts and all these addictions are, bear, we, when, we, when a person gives into that, they're bearing witness to it. God forbid that pushes God away from oneself. And that's what the Zer Shimshon means, that when a person's committed to God, he's bearing witness to God, God is there for him. God's more apparent in that person's life. And the opposite is unfortunately true as well. You know what God tells Abraham? God tells him as follows, I'm quoting, He vietamim. He tells Abraham, go, walk in front, take the path, but the path of being wholehearted, tamim, with me. That's what God wanted for him. And then after that, God tells him, test after test, circumcise yourself, circumcise your son, and he did everything. Because all God wants is our heart. He wants our commitment in any relationship that anyone will ever be engaged in. All the other person wants and all you want back is commitment. This is true between one's spouse. This is true with one's friend. This is true with one's family member. There is a certain feeling of priority that a parent or a child or a sibling or a cousin feels that they deserve over a stranger. And the truth is they're right. But the commitment has to work both ways. It's a two-way street. And the same is for a husband and a wife. The same is for a parent to a child, sibling to sibling, cousin to cousin. Both sides are looking for commitment. And when that commitment is done and completed with, that's when that relationship starts to grow. You know what? The relationship between us and God is no different. God showed His commitment. He created the world. He created humanity. He created everything that's in it. He created the beautiful beaches. He created hurricanes. He created it all. And He puts every single person where they need to be for their greatest potential, for their struggles, for their pleasure. So He did give us that commitment. He, thank God, gave us, brought us into this world healthy, not perfect, because no one's perfect, but healthy enough to deal with the life that He has set up for us. Now how do we show our commitment back to Him? That's what the witness is. You know what a good witness is in court? A witness who is committed to telling the truth. When you come and bear witness for a friend of yours, the last thing that your friend wants is for you to alter the truth for whatever reason. We are here in this world to bear witness to God's creation of the world, creation of ourselves, of Him being the Almighty and the King of this world. That's what God is looking for in us. And until we just get on that plan, we're going to be running like headless chickens. We're going to be running in the dark, not knowing where we're going. I say this over and over again. As soon as you change your outlook, of Judaism from being a religion to a relationship, everything makes sense. When God wants you to stop on the seventh day, turn your phone off, leave your car keys alone, don't touch your television, let your lights, lights on the whole time or let them work automatically on a timer. He wants you to do that to bear witness as the Torah says that He created the world that you live in, every single part of it. That he worked six days, worked six days to create it, and he rested on the seventh. You do the same. You want to know the greatest way to bear witness to do that? Is emulate the Almighty. You're working the six days, you're creating the six days, and you're stopping on the seventh. As soon as we change that focus from that, I'm going to use this word, the perverted word of religion, to the ultimate the enriching and inspiring word of relationship, life is different. And that's what is so unique between our religion, 
compared to others because ours is a way of life. Ours takes effect in every aspect of our life. Ours is a true relationship with our <coughs> Creator, with our peers, ben adam la makom, ben adam la chavero, our peers, and ben adam la atzmo, and between one and themselves. This is what is so fascinating and important to know about Judaism. Many go through their life not knowing this, learning a lot, doing a lot, but just thinking it's just, you know, a cold mandate, religion type Judaism. It's so sad because our religion, and I hate using this word, has so much more to offer than just that cold, black on white, rule-based type, textual way of living. There's so much more. And thank God we're all here and through the wisdom of the Zer Shimshon and our sages we're able to tap into that and connect to that. Moving on to the last part of tonight's class on the Zer Shimshon. Um, the Zer Shimshon does something which he doesn't do in every Torah portion but he addresses this week's Haftarah. The Haftarah generally is a portion of our Nevi'im, of our prophets, which is read after the Torah reading. So we have the Torah reading, the Torah portion every week, and afterwards we read a portion from the Nevi'im. The reason why this is so is because not only do we need to be well versed in our written Torah of the first book, the five books of Moses, but there's actually another 24 books of Nevi'im, prophets and Ketuvim, scriptures. Now obviously we don't get through all of them, but it's a dabble in them and it's a lot of the important episodes in our Nach, in our prophets and scripture. Having said that, there is most of the time, or there is always, and sometimes it's harder to locate, a connection between the Torah portion and the Haftarah. There's something very unique between the weeks of Tisha B'Av and Rosh Hashanah. There's actually a precise seven weeks, seven Shabbat between Tisha B'Av and Rosh Hashanah. This our sages, and as tradition has it, are the Sheva Dinechemta, the seven weeks, the seven Shabbats of consolation. From after going through three heavy weeks of mourning over the destruction of our temple, and then Tisha B'Av, a full 25 hours, 24 hours, dedicated to that day of of commemorating and remembering our temple and its unfortunate destruction and the reasons why, then we have now seven weeks consoling us up to the grand day, the first day of the year, Rosh Hashanah. This week's Torah portion is right in the middle. This week is the fourth week, and this Haftarah is the fourth Haftarah of the series of seven Haftarot that are being read. Now, these seven Haftarot, we use these weeks to remind us of the destruction of the temple and the state of, of being and the mindset of the Jewish people and then on to happier and better things. The previous two weeks were telling us, unfortunately, of the shortcomings of the Jewish people and different things that led to the destruction. This week it already gets positive. This week, the... Haftarah speaks to us about when the day will come that God will finally redeem us and bring the Mashiach. And certain, I'm going to quote to you just two different, very interesting um, aspects. It says over here, the Pasuk says, Uri, Uri, awaken, awaken, put your strength, O Zion. Put on the garments of your beauty, Jerusalem, the holy city. For no longer shall the uncircumcised or the unclean continue to enter you. Shake yourselves from the dust. Sit down, O Jerusalem. Free yourselves of all the bands of your neck, O captive daughter, O Zion. So we already see a positive upbeat of, of a redemption of, of coming up and lifting up. The beginning of this week's Torah of Haftarah is the questionable one according to the Zer Shimshon. The verse starts off and says, Anochi, Anochi, hu God says, I am the only one who will console you. Mi'at vatiri'i. Who are you that you should 
be fr- afraid from human beings who will eventually die, from mortals. And from men who will be made as grass, meaning they will eventually dis- disintegrate, decompose. So this is the, the verse, Hashem is saying, consoling us, don't fear anyone except for Him. The Zer Shimshon points out right away, now, this week during the Haftarah, let's hope to remember this because this is a fascinating, fascinating concept. Why does the verse say Anochi twice? Anochi means me, only me. Anochi, Anochi. If I tell you me, it's me. I don't need to tell you me and only me. Is it some type of flowery terminology? I and only I can spare you or save you. That's. There must be a reason for it, the Zer Shimshon says. Look at this amazing answer he gives. He says, he brings a midrash that, brings it, that tells us an anecdote. The anecdote is, imagine a king who was married to his queen for several years. And for some reason, the king decided that he is going to send the queen off and divorce her. Go figure. Well, it wouldn't be the first. <laughs> Come some time after... And he wants to take her back, the same woman. So you know what the woman says, whether she's playing tough ball or not, or pickleball. <laughs> she says, only if you double my ketubah, which means the document that a husband signs for his wife, um, promising that after, or God forbid, if they will have to divorce, a certain amount of money will be paid. Prenup. Prenup. Very good. <laughs> and she says, well, last time it was a million dollars, this time it's two million. Pretty nice, no? Mm-hmm. Well, not for the king, you'd expect more. But anyways, what does that mean? What type of analogy is that? So the Midrash says, the first time... God took the Jewish people as a wife. When was that? My Mount Sinai. Very nice. What was the first word God used? Anochi Hashem Elokecha. I am Anochi. Your God. The God who took you out of Egypt. We spoke about why specifically out of Egypt opposed to creating the world, right? Not for now. Just dragging your memory. What happened after the breaking of the the sin of the golden calf, the breaking of the tablets, the wandering for 40 years, the entering Israel and Jerusalem, building one temple and having it destroyed, a second temple, having it destroyed, the Jewish people being exiled all over the world. We're kind of like this divorced wife. (coughs) Think of it that way. We're, we're, we're trying to get a relationship, trying not. It's like back and forth. Again, remember, it's all a relationship. God comes back in the time of Mashiach and He says, Come back, my wife. We're going to say, How we know? How are we going to know? He says, Anochi, Anochi. I'm doubling down my prenup. 100% I'm committed. But He takes it a step further. He says, there's a difference between all other redemptions and the final one. Uh, the, the other redemptions, and let's take Egypt for an example, when God take, took us out of Egypt, He was involved, He promised Abraham He'd be involved, and He was, the tenth plague was administered only by God. No, no one else, nothing else could do it. The rest was done by Moses and Aaron, God guided them, but Moses and Aaron did it. And any type of redemption that has mortal intervention will not be everlasting and there will be some hardship to follow. However, God promises that a redemption which is solely done by God, God and only God, that type of redemption will be everlasting and no more pain and suffering to follow. So God will come, hopefully very soon, at the time of Mashiach, and he will say, Anochi, Anochi, Menachem Chem. I, and only I, not help from anyone else. Yes, there's going to be Mashiach ben David, Mashiach ben Yosef. They're going to be maybe just gathering us. 
But the redemption completely from beginning to end will be only administered by God and therefore it will be everlasting. So God comes and says, me and only me. He's doubling down. He's saying the same, you know, the same terminology that I took you with, but I'm doubling it this time. It's going to be for now and forever. We're going to end off with what the Talmud tells us in Masechet Shabbat, that one of the grand questions God will ask every single one of us when we pass on is, Tzipita Lishua. Did you long the salvation? Were you looking forward for the day of Mashiach? Rashi explains the way to develop, to long and look forward for the times of Mashiach is, did we really believe and look forward to the divrei nevi'im, the words of our prophets, of how they show to us, tell us about what the time of Mashiach is going to be? Of all the Jews coming back to Israel, repenting back to God, God revealing Himself through the building of the third temple, do we really, really, really look forward to that? Do we look forward to no more sickness, no more hardship, no more war? These are the things that we need to long for. It's not just the concept of Mashiach, Mashiach, Mashiach. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. No, we need more than that. We need to really, really, really imagine as much as our prophets picture to us, paint a picture of what Mashiach is going to be like, and really say, wow, my life would be so much better that way. It would be so nice to be united as a whole, not only as a nation, but as a world population. To be back in our holy land. Some of us don't even understand what it means to live in Israel. The truth is none of us really do, because even those of us who have lived in Israel, that's not the Israel that we need, that we, that we want. There's certain amazing aspects to it, but that's so far from what Israel is like when there's a temple and when there's a righteous Jewish king leading it with political motives to the side and God on the forefront of his mind leading us for our best interest, for the best interest of that relationship that we are to cultivate and grow through with our Creator. May Hashem bless us that we hear with our own ears Double Anochi. We all heard that one Anochi by the Ten Commandments. But these ears want to hear twice. Anochi, Anochi. God and only God will commit then and forever to our eternal salvation. Very soon. Amen, Amen. Thank you everyone for coming.